I bring you thoughts in the area of being empowered to pray. Empowered to pray. God is a prayer answering God. Somebody asked the question, why do you pray? I pray because God answers prayers. Isn't that good enough reason why we should pray? God answers prayer. Another good reason why I pray, I pray because I need help. I don't pray because I'm spiritual only. I pray because I need God's help. I need God's help. Amen. I pray because the Bible tells me to pray. That's another good reason. We are commanded to pray. Prayer is not an option. Prayer is commanded in the Word of God. The Bible says men ought to pray. And the word men there doesn't just mean for the men. It's just talking about you and I, people who know Him. We ought to pray always and we should pray without ceasing. There are many ways we can pray without ceasing. We don't have to close our eyes every time we pray. We can pray in many different ways. Isaiah chapter 41, reading verse 15 through verse 20. So follow me as I read. My text is verse 15, but I want to read from verses 15 through verse 20. Follow me as I read. Behold, I will make you into a new thrashing sledge, sledge which sharp teeth. You shall thrash the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like shaft. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away. The whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord, and glory in the Holy One of Israel. Verse 17, if you're following me. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them, the God of Israel. I will not forsake them. I will open rivers in desolate heights, fountains in the midst of the valley. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry spring, dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, and the archaeal tree, the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the cypress tree, the pine, and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Verse 15 says, Behold, I will make you. That's the empowering work of God. It is He who empowers us. He who will make us into a new sharp thrashing sledge with sharp teeth. You may ask me, what kind of instrument in, is this? I can't help but see it as an instrument that God has given you and I, an instrument that we can use. It's the instrument of prayer. It's an instrument of prayer. We can use this in instrument. We can pray. And if we do, what will it do? It says, we will thrash the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like chaff, chaff. And you shall winnow them. I like the way... It describes, you shall winnow. Winnow is the old style of the farmer who would go out into the field and harvest his petty, and then he would bring the, the, the petty in, and then he would break the grain uh, uh, so that the, the, the petty would be separated from the grain. By, by, by winnowing it, he will, he, will, he will have a little tray or a, or a big mat, and he would fling that thing up, and as it goes up, the, the husk will be, 
will be blown away and the heavy grain will fall down. He will winnow them away. In other words, that which is of a hindrance, that which is of no value, the winds will carry it away. But that which has the value will come back down and it'll be taken and it'll, it'll be kept. I will winnow them away. In other words, God will cause the wind to blow as, as we lift that grain with the, with the husk, with the grain as it's been broken and then it's winnowed. The wind will carry that husk and throw it away so that you will become that precious grain, that valuable substance that will mean a lot. I, I like the way it is said. The prophet says, I will make you. Speaks of God's empowering church. You and I must learn to avail ourselves in, in his presence. It is God who will cause us, who will help us. And that's why the Bible says he has given us the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will teach us to pray. And he will make us a sledge. Another word is a hammer or a large hammer, something that we, that we have in our hands that we can beat the mountains and beat the hills, the, the scripture says. You may ask me, Pastor, why? Why do you think this new sharp thrashing instrument is prayer? I'm going to use the words of Paul, Paul speaking to Timothy. And, and Paul's encouragement or exhortation to Timothy gives me the assurance that God is talking to Isaiah when he says, I will make you a new sharp thrashing instrument or a sledge. He was talking about a prayer, prayer that will come to us, that we can pray and cause mighty things to happen. So turn with me to... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. As to why I think it is prayer, I'm using the words that Paul spoke as an exhortation. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, Paul says to the Corinthians, For the weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God through pulling down of strongholds. He says that in Corinthians. But turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading at verse 18. He charges young Timothy. He says to Timothy, This charge I commit to you, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made, according concerning you that by them you may wedge the good warfare. Timothy is speaking, uh, Paul is speaking to Timothy. He is encouraging Timothy. He says, Timothy, listen, Timothy, if you are going to live for God, if you are going to serve God, Timothy, it's a warfare. It's a warfare. It's going to be a fight. And then he goes on in verse 19 and he says this, having faith and a good conscience, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. Faith and a good conscience. When we reject that, we go into shipwreck. And then he goes on in verse 20 and he says this, Of whom are uh, Hymenius and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. In other words, he says to Timothy, there's a warfare that you must fight. You must have a good conscience. You must have faith, Timothy. Don't be like these two. And he gives, he, he names two of them and he says, these two had shipwrecks. They, had, they didn't have a good conscience. They didn't have faith. And because they didn't have con a good conscience and faith in God, they blasphemed God. And Satan had advantage of them, took advantage of them. Now let's see what else he, he says to, to Timothy. Chapter 2. Same book, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, don't, don't forget, 
chapters are done by men. It's a continuation. Chapter 2, look at verse 1. After mentioning two examples, after telling him to fight the good fight of faith, after telling him that you've got to have good conscience and faith, then go into chapter 2, look at verse 1. He says, therefore I exhort you. Therefore I exhort you, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Timothy, I'm telling you there's a warfare. Timothy, I'm telling you you have to pull down strongholds. Timothy, the, the Christian walk is not going to be a very easy walk. Timothy, you're going to come into combat. Timothy, you're not only to have a good conscience and have faith, Along with your good conscience and faith, Timothy, I am exhorting you. I am saying to you, Timothy, with everything that I have within me, my encouragement to you is this. Pray, Timothy. Pray. Because if you pray, you will be able to fight that warfare and become victorious. A couple of things that Timothy, uh, that Paul talks about prayer, he says, there is supplications in prayer. Then there's also just praying. Then there is intercession, where we come to God, we are praying, but we are praying by intercession. Then there is also a prayer of thanksgiving. How many know how to pray these types of prayers? How many know how to come to God with your petitions? Most commonly, that's that's the one most of us know how to come before God. We come and all we, all we do is we, we say to God, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me this, help me this, bless me, touch me, grant to me. That's petition. And then there is the prayers where we simply come and we have a conversation with God. We just talk to God. Somebody says prayers is, 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 is a conversation between one person talking to God. And that's why we call it, because it is God, we call it prayer. When we have a conversation with another human being, we don't say, I'm praying to this person. We're having a conversation with this person. But when it comes to God and we have a conversation with God, we say we are, we are praying to God while we're talking to Him. He and I is having a conversation. How many know how to stop sometimes simply, simply coming to him with, with requests? How many know how to just find a place somewhere and just have a little conversation with God? Now, as long as you're talking to God, it's all right. And as long as, as it is a prayer that you're talking to God and, and nobody seems to be around, if somebody sees you talking and there's nobody around, it's okay. It's only when you start answering yourself that something is wrong. But it's all right if there's nobody around and somebody hears that you're talking, they wonder who you're talking to as long as you're not answering yourself back. Then when somebody asks you, what are you trying to do? I'm just having a conversation with God. I'm just talking to God. Don't raise your hand. How many have had a conversation this morning with God? How many prayed this morning? And yet, and yet Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to know, Timothy, I am exhorting you. I am saying to you, Timothy, it is a very important thing in your life. Timothy, it is so important because you're in a warfare. How many of you know you're in a fight? You're in a battle. Your successes in that warfare depends on your faithfulness in your prayer. Your success depends on your prayer. Turn with me and see a beautiful example of, of one who was praying to God, coming to God with a need. First Chronicles 
First Chronicles. No, First Samuel, sorry. We'll look at First Chronicles later. Look at First Samuel. First Samuel. First Samuel. Chapter 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. First Samuel 1. And look at verse 8. Here's a beautiful, beautiful example of one who comes to God and one who brings a petition to God. First Samuel chapter 1, reading verse 8. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? You see, Hannah was barren. And Hannah was very, very disappointed that she was not able to bear any child. Hannah would go to the marketplace. And Hannah would walk in her neighborhood. And those who were married who would see her would despise her because she wasn't able to bear. And in those days, it was so important that when you were married that you would have children. It's altogether different today, isn't it? Today we find means and ways how we cannot have children. But Hannah was, was, was despised by the village that she lived in, in the marketplace. She was so grieved and she was so disturbed by those who despised her. And, and her husband recognized and said, Hannah, what's the matter with you? And most likely the husband indicates here, she, he, he seemed to have guessed right. He seemed to have understood Hannah's, Hannah's problem and he says to her, am I not better to you than ten sons? Look at verse 9. So Hannah arose after they had finished. Now I'm reading it because if I tell you the story, I tend to take longer. So that's why I'm trying to read it to you so we get quickly to it. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat of the doorstep of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed. That's the key word there. There was a tremendous burden. Something was wrong. Something wasn't right, she understood. It wasn't that something was wrong with her, but there was some kind of hindrance. There was something that was rubbing Hannah. And Hannah realized she had no power against it. Hannah realized that it was something that she could do nothing of her own. There, there was no power of her own to, to fight this thing. And she comes to the tabernacle of God. And the Bible says, with bitterness of soul. In other words, with a heart, with a soul that was rendering, that was torn, with pain, with helplessness. And yet believing, and yet with a good conscience, and yet with faith in her heart. What did she do? The scripture said, she prayed to the Lord. And she wept in anguish. And she made a vow. Look at verse 11. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the afflictions of your handmaiden and remember me and not forget your hand, your, your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, and I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Look at verse 12. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. 
So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have not drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Paul, speaking to Timothy, he says to Timothy, bring your supplications. Have a conversation with God. Timothy, seek God. Timothy, come to God and tell God what your problem is. Because God will use, as you, as you seek him in prayer, God will use your prayer to become that sledge, that hammer, that can beat the mountains, that can beat the hills. Prayer. Turn with me. Of course, if you read on to the, to the end of the chapter, you would find in verse 27, towards the end of the chapter, you would find, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I ask of him. In other words, she prayed, God answered, God gave her that child. That which seems to have hindered her until she prayed. God granted her request. Turn with me to one more, very, very quickly. First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 4. First Chronicles chapter 4. Another very, very beautiful illustration. First Chronicles chapter 4. Look at verse 9 with me of First Chronicles chapter 4. Now Jabez was made, was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. That's very strange, isn't it? He was born, he was born in pain. But the scripture says that Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And yet Jabez, when he was born, brought tremendous pain and agony to his mother. But the Bible says he was more honorable. Now why? You'll find in verse 2. And Jabez called on the name, called on the God of Israel. In other words, Jabez understood the powerful instrument of prayer. Now Jabez called on the name, on the, on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory and your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. What was Jabez? What did Jabez do? The Bible says Jabez understood the powerful instrument of prayer. And he came before God and he said, God, I'm asking you. I, I, am, I am making my supplication. God, I want to tell you. I want to talk to you about myself. I want to tell you what's happening to me. And he said, oh God, I pray. I ask of you, I ask you, God, please. And how does that last sentence of verse 10 reads? How does it read? It reads this way. So God granted him what he requested. Can you see why he was more honorable than his brother's? You will have shipwrecks. You will have shipwrecks. You will not find success. You will not see things happening. You will not see victory come. Listen to me, church. 
You're not going to see things changing in your home. You're not going to see your life improving. You're not going to see the anointing of God upon your life. You're not going to see that anointing as you serve Him, as you live for Him, if you don't understand the importance of an instrument that God says, I have given to you. And if you will use it, you will cause powerful things to happen very, very quickly. Four things will happen when you pray. Are you ready? Four things will happen when you pray. Number one, the mountains and the hills will be brought down. Can I ask you a question? Right now, right now, where you are, is there a mountain standing between you in the place where you work? Right now, where you are, is there a mountain or a hill that is standing between you and your family? Right now, where you are, is there a mountain or a hill that is standing between you and your health and your finances, your relationships? Is there? Is there something that stands there and you say, oh, it's a barrier? It's a hindrance. I don't know how. I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability. I bring you an answer this morning. I show you God's way. I tell you what the Word of God says, that He can make you a sharp, a new, sharp, thrashing sledge or a hammer. You can beat that. You say, Pastor, how? Paul very distinctively tells me that it's a warfare that we are in. Satan doesn't like you. Satan doesn't like the way you live. Satan doesn't like the way you serve because he knows that what you do will bring the blessing of God. He's a robber. He's a destroyer. He will fight you when you want to work for God, when you want to serve God, when you want to live right. He wants to stand and he wants to hinder. It's a warfare. And what is it that's going to bring it down? It's your prayer. It is your prayer. Jesus puts it just a little different. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. If you're still alive and breathing, say an amen. Matthew 17, verse 20. Matthew 17 and verse 20. Jesus said to them, Because of unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say, one more time, if you have faith as a mustard seed, Matthew 17, 20, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say, let me say that one more time, you will say, you will have a conversation, you can speak, you can ask, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I'm not talking, I don't think that God is interested in literally moving mount, mountains, in, uh, literally moving mountains. He's talking about your life. He's talking about things that stand, hills and mountains that stand in your pathway. I don't think his, 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 I don't think God is not happy with the way Cameron Highlands is. That you have to say to Cameron Highlands or, or to Fraser's Hill, hey Fraser's Hill, move somewhere else. I don't think that's, that's the issue that he's after. He's talking about things in your life that stands as mountains and hills. And if you have the faith, you can say, you can speak, you can ask God. He can help you. He can cause those impossible things to be moved. And then goes, he goes on to say like this, however, verse 21, however, this kind does not go out except by what? Prayer. Prayer. 
prayer. Isaiah says, you shall beat the mountains. Jesus tells us in Matthew, he says, if you will pray and fast, mountains, mountains can be removed. Number two, Isaiah chapter 41 <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 18, the second thing that will happen when you pray is this. It will open rivers and fountains in desolate heights and in the midst of valleys. It will open rivers and fountains. How many need to see fountains and rivers where you live? How many need to see a refreshing How many know that there are possi possibilities of rivers and fountains, but they are not effective? The rivers seem to be dried up. The fountains are blocked. You know what's going to remove those blockages? Your prayers will remove them. Your prayers will remove them. There are rivers and fountains. It will open. It'll, it, they're there. They're there. But they've been blocked. They've been hindered. What's going to remove those hindrances? Your prayers will. It'll open, the scripture says in verse 18 of Isaiah chapter 41. It will open. Why? Why isn't it open? It has been blocked. So it has to be opened. Number three. Same verse. Verse 18, it'll make the wilderness and dry places a pool of water. How many need a refreshing? How many need a fresh touch from God? How many need a revival? Hey, it's not more services. It's not seminars and conferences. As much as these things are wonderful, church, but let me tell you what's going to be effective. Prayer will. Prayer will get alone somewhere. Find a place in your home. Come out to church. Use the prayer tower that we have. There's a, there are rooms in that prayer tower. Get alone with God. What will it do? It'll bring refreshing. It'll bring revival. It will cause something new, something powerful to happen. Number four, it'll plant trees in the wilderness and in the deserts. It'll plant trees. It'll plant trees in the wilderness and in the deserts. Let me tell you, prayer will make your life fruitful. How many are barren and fruitless in your life? How many are just a tree full of leaves? And people are looking at you, hoping that they might pluck a fruit to eat out of your life but they see leaves. There's no fruits on your trees. How many want to be fruitful? All kinds of beautiful trees. You, you read the scripture I, I, I read earlier to you. you re beautiful trees, he will plant them for you. He will cause you to become so very fruitful. Now, what's the benefit? You say, well, if I pray, you know, how... how What's, what's the benefit? Who is going to benefit? Who is going to benefit if I, if I pray? Look at verse 16 of that same chapter, Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, verse 16 answers the question, who is going to be profit? Who is going to benefit from it? Who is going to profit for it? It says this, you shall rejoice in the Lord. When you see the fountains and the, and the rivers flowing and when the trees are there and there is fruitfulness. When the blockages have been removed, mountains have been taken away, hindrances have been taken out, you shall rejoice. Jabez, when you pray Jabez, when you prayed and asked God and your mother called you Jabez because you were a pain. But Jabez, you prayed. What made you honorable? My prayers. It benefited me. 
I was blessed. I received blessing. Listen, when you pray, you're not doing God a favor. Do yourself a favor. Somebody say amen. Do yourself a favor and come to God in prayer and say, God, I'm praying not because you need help. I'm praying because I need help. I'm praying not because you need to be more righteous and more holy. I'm praying because I need to be more righteous and holy. I benefit when I pray. I am blessed when I pray. God anoints me. God elevates me. God honors me. God makes me honorable when I pray. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 14 says this, When you see this, your heart shall rejoice. Your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servant and his indignation to his enemies. Your hearts will rejoice. Your enemies will recognize and they will flee from you. You will rejoice in the Lord. Psalms 94 and verse 14 says this, For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. God will not cast you away. God will not cast you away when you pray. God will not forsake you when you pray. How many times has the devil whispered w words to you? No need to ask. He, he has forsaken you. He has no interest in you. He doesn't care for you. He doesn't love you. No! He does. He does. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. The purpose when God answers your prayers. Why does he do it? If, it? if it is all to my honor and to my glory, now why does God ask us to pray and that we benefit from it? The end result, the purpose of it all, the bottom line of it all. What's the bottom line when God begins to bless you and God begins to do mighty things in you so that you, and this is what God is after, has always been, right from the very beginning, God wanted a people that will declare his glory. God wanted a, God wanted a people that will testify that he, can, that he can look at them and say, see, these are people that are testimonies of who I am and what I'm like. God wants to do these things for you. Why? So that people would see. And when people see what God has done in your life, they will glorify God. You will become a testimony. And that's what verse 20 says of Isaiah chapter 41. That they may see, that they may know, that they may understand, that they may consider, the scripture says, so that they may see and they may know and consider and understand what? That God is a good God. How many of you know God is interested in wanting you to be a testimony for him? He is, he is desirous to bless you. So that what? So that people will see the blessings of God in your life and they would say to you, tell me your secret. Tell me. Why? Why are you like that? How come you can be like this? Why is it that you're always joyful? What is it that gives you the strength and the stamina to keep obeying and living for God? What is your secret? And you can say to him, I have a God who answers prayer. Somebody say amen. I've got a God who loves me. I've got a God who I converse on a daily basis. And he reaches down and he touches me and he renews me. God will empower you if you will find a place, if you will seek him. If you come with a good conscience, if you will come in faith and say, God, I need you. Help me. This is a week of prayer. I challenge you. If your prayer life has dwindled, if your prayer life has somehow been slowly left out, pick it up today. If you're saying, no, pastor, I'm a praying person. I pray always. Keep praying. Be encouraged by the word because your prayer will give you the victory 
over every mountain, every valley, every hill, every hindrance, everything that would stop, everything that would rob you of your health, everything that would rob you of success, for the honor and glory of God, keep praying. Because prayer is God's instrument that he has given to the church and given for you. Would you bow your heads with me, please?